From the Sky News Centre, this is Paul Murray Live. Thank you, Steve. Happy Monday, wherever you happen to be. On this show, we talk very frequently about how the people in power couldn't care less about how they spend your money. Now, we saw when it, come, when it came to companies and The Voice, they were willing to spend the shareholders' money because it would keep the activists at bay. But it's a particular note that I want to bring tonight to you, which is about how the Prime Minister is planning to spend another few hundred million dollars of your money to no benefit to you or your family. Now, of course, this is after the $450 million that he spent on the voice referendum, where, of course, the polls told us for how long that it was going to be defeated. And even though his own electorate voted for it, he may have to look outside the bubble, because outside the bubble, it doesn't matter where you go, people talk about the extraordinary waste of money that referendum turned out to be. Well, stand by for an even bigger spend from Anthony Albanese. It was a small story that was a blink and you miss it in the Sunday newspapers, but it is a very big story if you care about where your tax money goes. You see, apparently Anthony Albanese is OK with the Australian taxpayer spending $600 million on establishing a footy team in Papua New Guinea that would play in the National Rugby League. Now, I love all the people in charge of the National Rugby League. I think they're fearless sports administrators. I don't mind them for asking, but I will definitely have a go at the Prime Minister for answering. You see, the club is considered to be part of a soft power push, where, put simply, if little kids could one day dream of playing in the National Rugby League via a Papua New Guinean team, then somehow the government of Papua New Guinea will not end up falling into the clutches of China and its Belt and Road Initiative. That's the best reason, they say. But even then, it's not worth $600 million. Have a listen to how this is going to play out and why this is an extraordinary decision which no-one's followed up on today. Literally, this wasn't even a 24-hour news story. That's how tight the grip is that Labor has on most of the rest of the media. That even after wasting $450 million, they announce a new waste of $600 million. It's more than a billion... And it's not a story. Well, thankfully, it was in the Courier Mail at least this weekend. The NRL Commission and the Australian Government are in talks to the richest expansion project in rugby league's 115-year year history. $600 million for a new NRL franchise in the Pacific. Now, your logic there would be, OK, $600 million, OK, so how much is the Australian taxpayer tipping in? All of it. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese would not comment on the specific financial commitment, saying it was too early to discuss figures, but declared his strong support for the project, which would deliver infrastructure and an NRL team to represent Papua New Guinea. It's understood the federal government is prepared to bankroll a $600 million expansion package. What does this mean? $60 million every year for the next 10 years to help the economic development of Papua New Guinea and, of course, the NRL's push into the Pacific. But, of course, the real reason is to suggest that if kids like rugby league somehow, their parents won't end up selling out to China. I'm very supportive of an 18th National Rugby League team, says Albanese, on his return from the White House. Now, again, we'll debate this tonight about whether this is a good use of taxpayers' money or not, but the reason I'm going to tell you it's a terrible use of taxpayers' money is that let's imagine every single dollar of this went to a Papua New Guinean franchise that, for whatever reason, made it to the finals and started to make money at the end of its 10 years. Would the Australian government own the franchise? No, of course not. Would the successful franchise have to pay money back, say a $600 million loan, to the Australian government? No, of course not. It, of course, is a completely unfair playing field for every other club in the competition, that they are not backed by the taxpayer... But one club would be backed by the taxpayer to the tune of $600 million. Now, these deals always look good to politicians because they think the closer they can get the sport means the closer they get to Australians and Australians will therefore go, yay, I'll vote for this person because they get me and they get sport. But we've seen when these things turn electric, like the Tasmanian stadium deal, the one that looks like it could sink the Premier of Tasmania and 
the hope of Anthony Albanese that this might shift one or two seats back towards the Labor Party, well, it's all blowing up in their face. Nobody ever talks about this anymore, but the deal is still on the table. The federal government would pay $240 million for the new Tasmanian stadium. And the details under which the Tasmanian Premier made public, these are the deals that he's doing, not with Papua New Guinea, but with the AFL. The document confirms the Tasmanian government financial commitment of $60 million to assist in the establishment of the team's operation and to construct a high-performance centre. So $60 million bucks straight away. Then $12 million a year for 12 years. So now we're well over $120 million from the team's entry into the AFL and AFLW competitions. But guess what happens if, at the end of 12 years, and all of that public money, they don't have enough sponsors, they don't have enough corporate support, and it's not a profitable business? The AFL can take back the franchise and the taxpayers of Tasmania have nothing but an empty stadium that Elton John might have to be paid taxpayers' money to turn up at for his 428th farewell tour. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand the value of sport to our culture and sport to our economy. But when we're in a scenario right now that's not just the cost of living crisis, but one where people are in dire need of significant financial help in Australia, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to swallow this one. $600 million for one football team. Now, all the other football teams have to go off and get sponsors, not the one from Papua New Guinea, because you're the sponsor. Now, remember, last week we told you that 3.7 million Australian households had trouble putting food on their table in the past year. Food Bank is the organisation that put out this report, and they're the people who, of course, literally deliver food to people who are the poorest amongst us, including the working poor, people who have a job but don't have enough money for food on the table. Now, again, a breakdown of that 3.7 million households was half of all renters, a third of people who are paying off a mortgage. Those are the people that are currently struggling to put food on the table, but the Australian Federal Government has got $600 million for a rugby league team in Papua New Guinea? Now, should they put some money towards it? Yes, it's soft diplomacy. Should we pick up every cent for it? Hell no. And let's be realistic. One of the reasons why the competition wants to expand is so they can have more games. If they have more games than the broadcasters, well, they get pinged an extra amount of money on top of the already billion here and billion there that they have to spend to be able to get the games and put them on television and on radio. So there's no charity involved here. Now, again... I admire the administrators of Rugby League for asking. I cannot believe the Prime Minister is stupid enough at this stage to say yes. Now, if you think about how Albo has now suddenly found oh, $60 million, $60 million, $60 million, $600 million for a Rugby League team to join the National Rugby League competition from Papua New Guinea, how much money did Food Bank want from the federal budget that just went? Well, thankfully, all of these organisations put up online what their budget submissions are, what they ask for. Now, Second Bite, Oz Harvest and Food Bank all went in together. They asked for, among other things, an extra $45 million is required to ensure that food relief is available to those experiencing food insecurity all year round. Multi-year funding agreements commensurate with the depth of the food insecurity in Australia, will enhance the ability of Food Bank, Oz Harvest and Second Bite to deliver food rescue. So they want less money than the federal government is offering to pay for a football team in Papua New Guinea. Talk about your priorities that are screwed up. Now, this federal government has got more than $20 billion in the bank as a surplus. They should be using that money to get, cut petrol taxes today. But they should also be turning around to organisations like Food Bank that asked for 45 and give them twice as much as they wanted. Because when this many people are hurting this badly, that is the job of the federal government. That is our expectation as taxpayers, that no matter where you sit on the list of the tax bracket, the people who are the truly ones that are the most unfortunate. They're the ones who get the help. Not so the Prime Minister can play Pacific politics 
to the tune of $600 million. Put that together with a voice, a billion dollars, and no one in Australia benefits. Madness. Meantime, on cost of living, of course, it looks like another interest rate rise is on the precipice. It's either going to be next month at the start of November on Melbourne Cup Day or there'll be a little stick in the tail just before Christmas. Latest numbers here are worth talking about, where the cost of living remains, of course, a major issue, one that even the taxpayer-funded people who've just got their big pay rise still are starting to report on it. The cost of living isn't getting any easier and it's hurting a lot of people. We know that in the last month, inflation has been rising after the previous month. So for the past two months, it's been going up. And all of that means that when inflation is anywhere above 3%, then the Reserve Bank will do everything it can and it's only got one lever to pull. And that, of course, is to hurt us with interest rates. Now, of course, the cost of living pain that you're seeing here about the number of people that are having difficulty paying off their homes or the concerns that they have as inflation rises is all very real. Just last week, we told you that while well, the overall inflation figure is 5.6%, remember, it's got to get down between 2 and 3%, so we're, what, the best part of almost double where it should be? Things like electricity, gas, transport, insurance, dairy, rent, housing and food are all way above the 5%. Of course, even higher than all of that is the world of petrol. But again, I'll get to that in a second. But there are two indicators that the Reserve Bank seem to look at before they make the decision about whether they have to increase interest rates to try somehow to push down on inflation. One is, of course, the inflation figure itself, and then the second is about whether we are spending money at the shops. Because the reality of Australia right now is that the poorest are hurting more than ever before, but the richest, well, they're dancing in the streets. They couldn't care less. There is no change to their lifestyle. You see, they wouldn't even notice a 20% increase in their petrol or their power bills. But the retail trade numbers that came out today showed that there was, yes, a little increase in the amount of people that are going around the shops, which means there's a very good chance that with increased activity at the shops and inflation not moving anywhere, then interest rates may well end up being the thing that is about to change. Oh, yeah, and by the way, the huge surge in migration that has happened in the country with more than 2,000 people joining our amazing joint every single day for the past year... The expectation of 900,000 this year, one and a half million in the next two years, looks like it's going to be blown away. And all of that, guess what? Has increased the inflation picture, which is why we're in the world of pain. Meantime, the number of people who are struggling to pay the interest rate rises which have happened under this government, 12 in total, one under the previous, and that was when the sky was falling in, but 11 since, and we feel your pain... Well, Australian housing is now at a 40-year high in terms of the difficulties of being able to pay off the bills that make you pay off a house or pay for the things that are in it. Exclusive analysis by the Australian National University has shown that 28% of mortgage holders' take-home pay is currently being gobbled up on loan repayments. Also, things like council and water rates. As mortgage costs soars, cost of living standards are going backwards at a faster pace than the 90s recession. Oh, so the Prime Minister held a press conference about this, right, today? Oh, no, nothing to see here from the Prime Minister. Treasurer? No, nothing at all. Instead, the only thing we've been able to find of the Prime Minister in the media in the past 24 hours was this puff piece on Channel 9. Prime Minister touring an Italian festa in Leichhardt. It's 200 million more, forget it, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> you tired, buddy? I am tired. <laughs> Surrounded by culture from the other side of the world. Seriously. Remember how I talked about in last night all of the different reporters that will spread around Albanese's dirt unit, which, of course, is now going to be right in the heart of the Prime Minister's office because they think the biggest problem facing the country is Peter Dutton? The biggest problem facing the country right now is a government that is doing nothing about what is hurting millions of Australians and is literally giving $15 million more than even the charities have asked for out of the federal government to keep food on the table of the poorest amongst us. $45 million for those three charities about food, $60 million every year for the next 10 years, $600 million dollars for a football team in Papua New Guinea. Meantime, petrol prices, I'm going to keep on about it. 
petrol prices, they remain very high, depending on where you buy, uh, what time of the day, and whether you stand on one leg and you pull your rear load, it might be ever so slightly down on where it was last week. But when you have a look at this graph, which the ABS put out, you can tell us the average uh, cost for petrol in September 2020 was about $1.20. Now, it's pushing way past $2. This is your average unleaded. It might be slightly more, might be slightly less than where you are. But you can see petrol always goes up. Even when it has a little up and a little down, it always ends up going up. And as I've said, this government has $22 billion more than it needs for its extraordinary spending spree at the moment. And don't forget, this is expected to be one of maybe one or two surpluses for the next 40 years. So why not use some of that money to cut petrol tax by 25 cents a litre tomorrow? You could do it for six months, it'll cost $3 billion. You can do it for 12 months, it'll cost $6 billion. So you'll still have plenty of money left over to pat yourself on the back with. You'd still be able to say that we achieved what no other government could because, of course, now they count the future fund and all of those evil mining companies that their policies on one hand want to shut down, but on the other hand, their government desperately needs to fund all of the promises they make, including the $600 million for a football team in Papua New Guinea. So we've been saying it for weeks, feels like months, but weeks we've been saying on this show, you got this extra money, this is something that will help people from tomorrow, and it sets them up for six months where, yes, it might still continue to go up, but you're saving them the pain of what could be down the track. Well, it looks like we may have a friend in Peter Dutton. Peter Dutton was interviewed on this channel uh, in the past 24 hours. He was asked directly about would he think about supporting a government decision if they chose to do so? Would he help it pass the parliament? Here's what he said. Now, there can be temporary relief uh, through a reduction of excise if they believe that that's going to be of benefit. Uh, uh, it's costly uh, and it can be gained by uh, the oil giants, but uh, there are periods where it is effective and I think you need to make... Uh, a point-in-time decision about whether that's the best economic response. So watch this space. Wheels are in motion. May we get a win? Who knows? The PM will never want to give us one. He doesn't want to give Peter Dutton one, but can you start demanding it? Pick up the phone, ring your local MP. Cut petrol excise. They've got the money to do it. They can do it for six months. I think they can do it for 12 months. Or they can even do 50 cents for six months. There's a novel idea. And they'd still have money left over. There's an interesting court case which is playing out right now uh, involving Qantas and the ACCC. You see, Qantas has decided to go after... Sorry, the ACCC has gone after Qantas because they claim that they sold 8,000 tickets on flights that had already been cancelled. Qantas has interestingly turned around and said, well, it was only for 48 hours and the computer system wasn't really working. And this, in part, is why the ACCC is going after Qantas and may well end up fining them a quarter of a billion dollars that having made the decision to cancel flights, they firstly, as you referred to, PK, they continued to advertise for, on average, two weeks after, but in some cases up to 47 days after. $250 million, that's less than half of $600 million for a football team. They honestly think that we are that stupid. We aren't. Well, we ain't, I should say. As for Qantas, their response, which has been delivered to the courts today, was also uh, put up on their website today. Let me read you a little bit of it, because this is rather interesting. While, airline, while all airlines work hard to operate flights at their scheduled times, no airline can guarantee that. That's because of the nature of travel. When weather or operational in, uh, issues mean that delays or cancellations are inevitable or avoidable, makes such a guarantee impossible. But they continue. For this reason, our promise is to get customers on their way to their destination as close to possible to the time they booked or on the, an alternative service at no extra cost. You see, what was quite interesting today is that what Qantas actually said today, in part, was when you buy a ticket, you're not buying a ticket for a flight to a destination at exactly the time that you are buying one. I think the legal term here is a bundle of rights, that an airline called Qantas will get you there as close to the time as you preferred, which was the time that you booked. The sharp eyes of the Financial Review have seen that this may well be good legalese, but when you've effectively told people, yeah, I know you booked on the midday flight, but you've really bought a bundle of rights, Customers may think they've been slightly done over here. 
Legally, even logically, the argument makes sense. Stuff happens in aviation, safety concerns, air control, blah, 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 and Qantas can't guarantee a flight. But how, but how hard does the airline want to push the idea that it doesn't actually sell airfares or tickets, just a bundle of rights? Good point. Now, of course, it should be illegal for any airline to sell tickets on a plane that has already been cancelled. The idea that it seems that the airlines are able to sell tickets on planes they may or may not cancel is the grey area that we're sitting in right now. Now, I get it. It's difficult, it's logistically complicated and there's a lot of moving parts. But if you've already cancelled the flight, you probably can't sell tickets to the midday flight if it doesn't exist anymore. Oh, but it was a computer glitch. Meantime, a little a few, couple of extra options for people who fly in regional areas. G'day to everyone watching us on Sky News Regional tonight. Hope you're having a lovely one on a Monday night. Rex is going to start flying into different locations. They're adding a couple of extra flights in and around Cairns. So keep an eye on this space. Again, a running theme this week is that uh, there are plenty of stories that if the politician was of a slightly different political colour, we know it would be scandal, scandal, scandal. But because it's the political colour that they prefer and they like the arrangements that are all now in place, they don't want to call out a scandal, even if the horse is being dragged to the water. And I know that you can't force them to drink it, but you get my point. Don Farrell, the Trade Minister... If you've been watching the show every night, you know what this story is. If you're a latecomer, let me explain. Don Farrell is the Trade Minister. Today, the big news was that the Trade Minister walked away from a potential free trade deal with the European Union. Well, a last-ditch attempt at a free trade agreement with the European Union has collapsed. A $100 billion free trade deal over Australian meat and other products with the European Union has fallen through. Formal talks were actually supposed to happen today, but we understand informal talks between the parties stalled last night. Trade talks to give Australian farmers greater access to the European Union's multi-trillion dollar markets have again broken down. Australia wants better access to the EU market for our beef and our sheep meat, the Europeans unwilling to give ground there. So we've proved that every media organisation in the country knows who the Trade Minister is. We've shown that they all have file footage if he doesn't give them an interview, so they know how to cover Don Farrell. But for some reason, the very same media organisations have no interest in covering Don Farrell. There he is arriving in Japan on, yeah, that's right, a taxpayer-funded flight, because apparently there's no commercial jets that fly between Australia and Japan. So you had to pay for him to fly there. I'm sure it's just a fraction of the $600 million we're going to apparently give to the makeup of a new football team in Papua New Guinea. But the story that all the media organisations should be focusing on when it comes to Don Farrell is the one they all want to pretend nothing to see here. And that's that the Trade Minister had a job to give away. It was a job to a trade representative post and also to be sort of a deputy mini-ambassador based out of San Francisco and California in the United States. Now, lots of people applied, a committee decided who the best person was, and they thought that it was this woman. After all, she applied for the job. But the bloke who ended up getting it was this bloke, who was a backbench senator you've never heard of, who, according to testimony given to said estimates, is a bloke who did not apply for the job when it was advertised last year and has no experience in trade investment. Yet he got the job anyway. Why? Because you may notice the background behind him is that he's a former senator, a former Labor senator, a former mate in the parliament and presumably mate for life of Don Farrell. Wasn't there a many-month conversation when the former New South Wales Deputy Premier had a job that was available, a committee that decided a woman was better for the job, yet decided to put himself into the job? Yeah, I suppose that's just state politics, right? Well, thankfully, Brad Norrington is still writing about it at The Australian and he is pursuing the issue because he said that uh, the staff are unsurprisingly unhappy with the decision that has been made by the minister to put in a Labor senator, a political mate, a guy who didn't even apply for the job when it was first put up there, into the gig. Staff at a key Australian government trade mission in the US are incensed that the Trade Minister, Don Farrell's decision to appoint a former one-term Labor senator with no experience in the area as their new boss. A number of Austrade business investment team in San Francisco are understood to be baffled at why the senator dumped the recommendation 
of advertised recruitment process for Kristen Thompson to be the person who actually got the job instead of the bloke Chris Ketter. But then again, of course, Chris is a Labor mate and she'll eventually get a job at some point in time. But again, all the media have an opportunity to report on this story, but very few of them, bar the Australian, are interested. All of the media do interviews with Don Farrell, but don't ask him any questions about it. I wonder why. I don't know. Because this has all of the ingredients that are necessary. Jobs for the boys, rank hypocrisy, the woman getting screwed over for the job, and political favours. But I suppose it's not as interesting as $600 million for a football team. Taxpayers paying for a football team in Papua New Guinea. But even then, they're not interested in that story, are they? Because it's not as cute as hanging out with Albo while he orders ice cream? Quick break, back with more. Lots to talk about this evening with the Cracker Jack panel. Looking forward to it. Bromer Bishop, Nicholas Reese, Caroline Marcus. We're just getting started. Oh, yes, we're going to talk about 600 million bucks for a footy team and a lot more here on Paul Murray Live. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much for watching wherever you happen to be. How's this for a Cracker Jack one this evening? Well, we can't just wait till Thursday. Let's get it here on Monday. None of the wonderful Bronwyn Bishop. The memo's gone on about white, which I appreciate, and the lovely <laughs> Caroline Marcus. And the man who's going to do battle for the... Uh, I was going to say common sense. The left... No. The, anyway, the, the Melbourne perspective. Let's put it that way. None other than the great uh, Nicholas Reese. So uh, before I get to you, Nicholas, I'll give you a couple of seconds to quickly work out how Don Farrell has not got away with something weird here. But don't you love this here, Bronwyn, where the Trade Minister... Um, Today, everyone was able to cover him. They've all got footage of him. Uh, after the EU trade deal's fallen apart, they go back to it after the next federal election. Fine, whatever. Um, but this has all the ingredients of what normally makes up the Canberra Colombo scandal, right? Politician chooses one of their mates, literally, from the parliament to fill a job that they didn't even apply for and a woman gets screwed over. Mm. Yet nobody's reporting on it, Bromley. Amazing. Amazing, isn't it? The sheer hypocrisy is just scandalous because it is a replay of the John Barillaro uh, scenario. Correct. Where he was forced out of that job by media critiques and people setting up committees in the parliament and all carrying on, exactly the same thing. But at least he'd been a deputy premier. At least he knew something about the job he was going into. At least he applied for it. And he applied for it. This man who I'd never heard of, I have to say. One termer from the Senate. But he, how was good he, just, is. he was just a shoppy st steward in the trade union movement. Yeah, and then when Farrell's asked to try to backfill it, oh, well, well he understands <laughs> uh, workplace oh. relations. No, he doesn't. Yeah, and it's absolutely nothing. And he's a no-hoper, which will drive everybody crazy. And, Nicholas, <clears throat> well, you might laugh because you should be out there criticising it as well. I have no doubt that Nicholas was laughing at my incredible hosting skills. But, uh, again, Nicholas, help me out here. Um, sometimes in government you can see the freight train coming, but to see a freight train as obvious mm. as this change track and keep going past and nobody pays attention is an extraordinary get, <laughs> get out of jail. Because you know what you'd be doing if it Look, was I Morrison, Dutton, Frydenberg, anyone else? Oh, I... Paul, I mean, I, I think it's pretty unfair of you accusing me of bias on this program. I mean, let's start with what okay, we then can rip all into this deal. That is that so <laughs> sometimes, sometimes politicians are just the right person for but these this time. overseas postings. I got they I'm have to apply of, for know, them. Arthur Sinodinus going to Washington and Stephen Smith there in the UK doing a good job. Kevin so Rudd. Certainly there is a track record of politicians doing oh. really well with overseas appointments. Now, look, Chris Ketter may not be a household name, but he's a well-respected oh. figure. And Don Farrell uh, is a who? very uh, wise head in federal politics. And I'm sure uh, he will have considered this appointment very carefully, and he's someone who's known for his good judgment. You can't the man and who will decide decision whether you making. do or don't make it and to so the I'm Senate. I'm not across the, all the details. Oh, on this that's, that's the ultimate. The that's the pull. Pull the ripcord. I'm out of here. I've never heard so much. Caroline, please, please, in my, please. I've never I'm, heard I'm, so much. I'm, I'm showing mercy. I'm showing mercy to my friend when he, when I'm sure his side wouldn't show it in return to us. But I think we all, we all just saw the white flag just go up in the air. Then I've never heard so much hogwash in my life, and I've been on a panel with Nicholas Reese. 
many times. <laughs> Look, the fact mm. that they had to get the woman who was overlooked for this position to train this bloke yes. for the last few months because he doesn't know how to do the job, <laughs> I think tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> but not only is it the hip hypocrisy, because Labor obviously went hard over the Barrett Laro stuff, but I thought they were all about promoting women. Paul. I mean, they keep banging on about they have 50-something percent women in the federal parliament. They're about quotas. And here they had a woman who was perfectly trained for this exact position, that the people in their office, the Trade office, wanted her. They can't believe she was overlooked for someone who didn't even apply, a male. Who does it go but to, it, a male? That just proves the point about quotas exactly. what you get Which is I don't they don't support. they don't care about the women at all no it's totally they're always there to be screwed over if necessary the again. point is he had a mate presumably he got chucked out of the senate pre selection after one term because he was no good uh, otherwise he may be still there yeah. but the point is Barilaro had credentials and he applied. This man has no credentials and didn't apply. Well, and, and, and again, you know, Caroline, you yeah. know what this is like, right? Where you've turned around and you've done reporting where you have got all the receipts, all right? You know that it has all the ingredients to be a story that runs for more than one day and jump out of one particular news silo. Now... But, of course, it doesn't happen. Why? Because they don't like from whence the original reporting came. Oh, that um, does look suspicious. And, it and does. sadly, it, it does feel like this is, again, one of those scenarios where as long as we can keep it at the Oz, as long as the fat bloke's yelling about it on Sky News, then, you know, we've, we've got it down here. But surely, again, anyone with any modern knowledge of how uh, stories can run can smell this one from a mile away. You just think about it. What, it, what if it had been... Scott Morrison or someone in his party, and then it would have been more about how the Liberals have a women's Mate, The problem. Guardian would have a special section. Um, yeah, special. <laughs> you know, in between out. donations and desperately, you know, asking mm. and begging you for money. Anyway, mm. let's talk about Qantas uh, and their position where they've gone in response to the ACCC. Now, again, I mentioned here that the shortened way to explain this on television is, again, to basically say that it feels like what Qantas said today uh, to the courts was... Okay, you know, when you buy a ticket, you don't buy a contract for us to necessarily deliver the exact time that we are booking. Instead, kind of roughly, we'll sort of hopefully get you there. Nine times out of ten, we should be able to get you there, but we reserve the right to be able to move you here, there and everywhere. But again, and because these things are being argued, I don't want to get myself into trouble in any way, but still, um, hardly a jury trial, I'd imagine, in this scenario, but still. Which is, Bronwyn, the company at, has admitted... 48 hours a system meant that they were selling tickets to flights that technically didn't exist. That's why the ACCC is going after them. The idea that, OK, yes, sometimes they have to cancel flights, that's nothing new, but it's a little bit of an idea about how grey this is, that you think you're buying the midday flight to Melbourne. You think you're buying the 1pm 1 1 flight to Brisbane. You're not. You're buying sort of hopefully the 1 o'clock flight to Brisbane. Yeah, well, you know, it's a very technical defence... Um, I think the real question is, what are the CEO and the chairman of the board and the rest of the board, for that matter, know that this was being done? And did they see that by doing it, they would get a financial advantage? That'll be the real test, because the technical uh, defence may well succeed, uh, but it's the intent with which it's done that I think the ACCC has gone ahead with the prosecution. Yeah, I mean, and again... And the, it stinks to high heaven. That's the point, right? So, so again, Nicholas, I understand that the one o'clock flight to Brisbane uh, is affected by a lot of different things, from crews not being able to board in Adelaide to the winds that might be there on the second and third air. air. I get all of that, right? But selling tickets to flights that don't exist, there has to be a penalty for it. Yeah, I mean, look, I think Qantas, they've got the status as our national carrier. Uh, the truth is that there are a lot of benefits they get from the regulatory arrangements in this country. And so we have every right to judge them to a high standard. And having a situation where uh, they continue to sell flights on a, uh, tickets on a flight that got cancelled 48 days earlier or they wait 47 days before notifying you that a particular flight has been cancelled, is not good enough. It's simply not good enough. And I'll tell you what's going to be interesting this week. You know, we had Qantas in the Senate last week. 
but they've got their AGM coming up this Friday, and I reckon it's a case of pack, pack the popcorn because there'll be a lot of angry shareholders that'll have a lot of questions for not just the CEO, not just the chair, but some of those directors as well. Well, it's the first thing their PR department's got right in a while. Put it on a Friday when hopefully nobody's paying attention. So the 6pm news, which often is one of the least watched of the week, everyone moves on and starts talking about everything else that's around. But again, Caroline, uh, yeah, people's faith in the aviation sector right now, not amazing. Mm. Um, you would imagine that it's Qantas's opportunity to get this behind them as fast as possible. Who knows whether it ends up in a settlement, as suggested by uh, the good folks over at the AFR. But do you think that Australians, uh, you know, again, I mean, when Nicholas talks about National Airline or all of that stuff, right, I understand that that's been the longhand branding and all the rest of it when it was a taxpayer-funded uh, organisation, but now it's been proven to be a pretty nasty uh, competitor when it's gone after uh, the smallest of airlines from long-gone airlines like uh, uh, Compass and Compass. Anset, and we know what happened in the early days of, of Virgin. But I just don't know that, uh, that, that, that Qantas is playing with the full hand that it thinks that it does. I think the Australian people are kind of gone, you know what, mm. you're just another business. Yep, we remember the song, mm. but you're just another business. Oh, look, I think they've lost a lot of goodwill with the Australian public, and it's not just about how they conducted themselves during COVID, which is letting all these people go and then, you know, doing this to their customers who had faithfully bought tickets. It's one thing to say you might not get on the midday flight on Monday to Melbourne. It's another thing to continue continue selling tickets for 48 days after that to a flight, you know it's cancelled. But on top of that, they've had the brand reputation, quite rightly, from jumping on the virtue signalling bandwagons of The Voice and same-sex marriage and lecturing the country about all these different political campaigns, spending how much money putting the yes sign and flying yes advocates around the country, mm -hmm. uh, blocking the Qatar Airways flights from Correct. coming, which would have brought prices down for customers. So how can they, uh, they, they... They can't possibly think that they can go into a court case with a country behind them. All right, quick break. Back with more. Lots to talk about. This panel all night long. Long, sitting back, old school, Paul Murray live, where we've just got the same crew all night long. Looking forward to about 20 minutes away from the late debate. And if you want to ever send me an email, please do. Paul at sarahnews.com.au. More in a sec. Well, as you would have heard by now, lots of Prime Ministers, in fact, all living Prime Ministers, with the exception of Paul Keating, all got together and all agreed on one thing, which was a letter that's absolutely clear about Israel's right to defend itself. Yes, an awareness of civilian casualties in Gaza, but absolute clarity that the federal government has not quite been willing to go there. Now, if you want to make some mischief in all of this, of course, uh, Tony Abbott, John Howard, Malcolm Turnbull, Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd. Interestingly, Kevin Rudd, of course, isn't just a former prime minister. He technically works for Penny Wong, whose position is nowhere as strong on this issue as the one that the former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, now Ambassador Rudd, has signed on to. How did all of this come about? Well, Tony Abbott was on the radio this afternoon with my mate Chris O'Keefe on 2GB. You don't often uh, find uh, Tony Abbott singing Malcolm Turnbull's praises. You do not. But this, this was really Malcolm's great work here. My understanding of the genesis of all of this is that Josh Frydenberg... Uh, my former colleague and uh, distinguished former treasurer, Josh, approached us all. Uh, we all said yes. Um, Malcolm, I think quite suitably said, look, if it's gonna come from all of the former prime ministers, it should be drafted by one of us. Malcolm then drafted the words. Um, we all uh, had our say. There were one or two minor amendments made. I think Malcolm's done a wonderful job. Now, Caroline, we talked about this, of course, last night on the Sunday Showdown, which I'll pop up on with your good self every couple of weeks. Looking forward to doing so. 7 o'clock Sunday nights. Um, absolute clarity from these former yeah. Prime Ministers. Again, the side road here is to talk about the, the potential mismatch between the Foreign Minister and her Ambassador to Washington, but seems to have greater clarity from former Prime Ministers than the current one. I know, it does. And, I mean, kudos to those former Prime Ministers who signed it. And it is rare for us on this program to give kudos to Malcolm Turnbull, but he has always been strong on the issue of Israel and he has always been a great supporter of the Jewish people, which has not gone unnoticed from, by the Jewish community, I can tell you. Um, it was a really strong, unequivocal letter in that it blamed... Uh, Hamas firmly for not just obviously the horrific slaughter that we saw, but the thousands of civilian deaths. It did say that, you know, Israel has made a promise to 
act with as much humanity as possible in trying to save civilian lives, but it acknowledges that it is Hamas that is ha putting its people out there. And it talks the about anti Semitism in and a it fashion. It talks about anti Semitism, which is the second front that we are facing and what the Jewish community here and around the world is especially mm -hmm. terrified of. This is not just a conflict that's happening in the Middle East. We see it on the pro in protests that are happening in Sydney. We saw it straight away before Israel even retaliated that people were chanting for Jews to be gassed on the steps of the Opera House, to our great shame. We saw the scenes in Russia today of Jews being lynched like a, like a pogrom. You're trying to yank them off planes. Uh, yeah. Getting their papers checked. Um, in Russia by a predominantly Muslim community there in Russia. It is really terrifying right now. So to have this kind of moral clarity from politicians, from leaders of all sides, is wonderful. Where's Paul Keating? I don't know, but and, uh, he, he hasn't revealed his reasons for not signing this letter, but the criticisms of him that I've heard of late, that he's increasingly bitter and isolated appear to be the case here, I have Well, to mate, say. But, you know, they, they talk a lot about the, um, Abbott and Turnbull in the same place, Rudd and Gillard in the same place, let alone Rudd, Gillard, Turnbull, Abbott and Mr Howard, all in the same place. But that, that specific focus in, on anti-Semitism. Let's jump back a step here, Bronwyn. Former Prime Ministers all will slowly take their pot shots at the current administration about being too much this or too little that. For all of them to come together and to say something like, this is... This is virtually unprecedented in, in modern politics. Are they speaking with one voice because they think that the current government is not speaking with a loud enough voice? Because obviously Rudd works for this government and Gillard doesn't want to see this government fall over. So why did they put their well, names I, to it? Well, I think it is important because with particularly Tony Burke and his outburst has shown that he is prepared, prepared to defy the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister is not demanding his resignation. So I, I think it is important that they've come out and done it. And I think it highlights something else. And we were talking privately earlier. The, the, there is a, a river of hatred that stems between Europe and into the Arab world that is all about killing Jewish people. I mean, in World War, in 1941, Hitler sat down in Berlin with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Let me show it to you. There he was. And what they agreed on was that Jews should be killed. Mm. He wanted to bring a big revolt of the Arab communities to be in line with Hitler. At that point, everybody thought Hitler was going to win the war. So it, it is a continuity. When World War II ended, it didn't end the hatred. 6,000 of s senior Nazis went to Cairo to advise NASA. It included Adolf Eichmann, who was there in 1948, mm. who conducted a program against Jewish people and 10,000 people were thrown out. He had other people who'd been head of his propaganda who implemented the sort of policies that had been active in Germany while before the world, before the, Hitler and his National Socialists were defeated. Mm. So when we're looking at what's happening in the world now, we, we should not be surprised because that latent hatred is still there and it has to be combated. And that's why those Prime Ministers coming out with that statement is so important. Yeah, I mean, Nicholas... It's saying to... It's saying to the current Prime Minister, Albanese, you've got to hold firm mm. and you cannot tolerate the likes of Tony Burke coming out and doing what he's doing. I mean, Nicholas, it's hard not to think that that is the message being sent here because former Prime Ministers, they'll all do interviews here and there, criticise, but to actually sign up to a document to essentially say this lineage of leadership from 1996 to today is all of one view, that's very powerful. And again, we have not seen these things before. I don't even think I can think of occasions where all of the Prime Ministers are together at anything other than a funeral of a past Prime Minister. What do you think it means? Look, look, I think it's an absolutely excellent thing that the former Prime Ministers have done this. And like you said, I think it's a very 
powerful gesture. Uh, I think Malcolm Turnbull's done a very good job in drafting the letter, and I really would encourage all your viewers to take the time to read the letter. It's, it's beautifully written. You know, when it talks about the... Uh, uh, powerfully written, when it talks about the evil tenacity of anti-Semitism, I, I think it captures the... Uh, that, that that sentiment very well. I, I do think it's very balanced as well. Like, it's, it's obviously absolutely denounces the atrocities of Hamas. But as Carolyn has flagged, it also talks... It urges Israel to recognise common humanity in its response and stresses the importance of humanitarian aid reaching Gaza, which I think is really important. And finally, one part of the letter which I think has been much overlooked but I think is absolutely critical was where it says that Australia's success has been built on the fact that we have not allowed overseas conflicts to divide us here in this country. And I think that's something really important. Well, and, and, and that is a message to the protesting. It is also a message to some of the signs that are being held up at the protest. Some of the things right. are being said. We are being divided right now. Yeah, mm. exactly. But it's not being held mm, off anymore. All right. Thank you, gang. Do appreciate it. I wanted to give you all a good bite at that one. So I will see you all again next week. Mm. Uh, all right. Quick uh, break and plenty more to talk about, including some big events out of Queensland. You want to know why Anastasia Palaszczuk is in trouble? I'll show you the tape. Want to see? The issue of youth crime, it will be one of the key determinants in the next state election in Queensland. Now, we've said that before, but it feels that this has been different in the past four years. We did, of course, our famous show a bit earlier this year in Toowoomba, and we get correspondence about it all day, every day. And there have been rolling protests which have, again, felt different than any other time before in Queensland. Now, in the past couple of days, there was a community cabinet that was held in Townsville. Now, Townsville is a place that, strangely, has a horrible problem with youth crime. It did so before the last state election, but then they turn around and keep electing a huge number of Labor MPs in this area. It happens time and time again, and I don't know why that's the case, because every time I go to Townsville... That's what people want to talk about. Now, obviously, it might be a self-selecting crowd that come up and say, aren't you the fat bloke from the TV? I understand that. But still, you get my point, is that the issue is one that frustrates people. And you would think it would not just be a long team red team blue lines, but there's something in the air in Townsville. So the Labor Party knows how important it is that they don't lose the seats that, for some reason, they've been able to hold on to in this place that is an epicentre of youth crime. So there was a community cabinet in Townsville. Now, at that community cabinet, there was a protest. The protest was interesting to notice because the victims of crime had said that they had had enough. The Premier is just up there, sitting in her ivory tower, while us, the victims and concerned citizens of Townsville, are down here. But the Premier didn't come downstairs. Instead, it was the local Labor MP, one of those, again, mysterious figures who keeps being re-elected, I say mysterious politically, for the Labor Party keeps sending back, despite the area going backwards on youth crime. And this is what this charming bloke had to say to this crowd of people who were annoyed at youth crime changing their lives. Get it all out now. Get your abuse out now. Have a little bit of respect. I bet you if I walked around half a year of bloody LMP anyway... Oh. I'll rent the crowd. Seriously? Now, I don't know the political affiliations of every single person there, and I'm pretty sure none of them are going to vote for him at the next state election. But one of the people who was organising this has been doing so from his hospital bed as a result of youth crime. There's no admission that everything they've done is failing. And, again, that person was one of those that were protesting, but one of the blokes responsible turned around and from his hospital bed said, no, not true, and it's offensive. So Palaszczuk may be able to control the media, but you can't control the people. And, fingers crossed, the people of Townsville will control themselves and vote differently the next time around so they can get proper representatives who don't call residents rent-a-crowd. Here's a late debate.